Beloved, please turn with me to your copy of God's Word, to the, the second chapter of Ephesians. And as you are turning there, according to the beginning of Ephesians chapter 2, humanity without Christ is a people without hope. So people who are out, outside of God's will, outside of God's intent, outside of God's glory. And from that comes a lack of that sense of belonging. And with it comes a senseless pursuit of the now popularized zeal for a meaning in life. That only leaves our world groping in their sin, and it magnifies their death and estrangement from God. The eternal answer to these questions in our world and the challenges in our world, a world without hope, is is in the Lord Jesus Christ, is the Son of God who came to bear our sins, uh, becoming the object of the Father's wrath against us. And in satisfying God's righteous requirement, he became our righteousness. Now in the Lord Jesus Christ, every outcast receives full welcome. They belong to him and they belong to each other. Uh, that belonging is the message from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. But what led up to, to that conclusion, that, uh, that crescendo of truth in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22? Well, in verses 11 through, 20, 11 through 18 of Ephesians 2, uh, we have two historical realities. Uh, the first was between God and his created people. Uh, these uh, this issue was a historical hostility between God and man after Genesis 3. But then there's another hostility that is spelled out in Ephesians 2, beginning with verse 11, and it is between Jews and Gentiles, or Jews and the other nations. Uh, both of those hostilities end when the power of the gospel draws sinners to salvation. Now Jews and Gentiles receive the same mercy, receive the same blessings in Christ, and can enjoy a share in the beginning of the end of hostility. And so we must always consider this, beloved, that the power of hostility in our world today, in our times today, is broken only in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, beloved, what does that mean for the church today as we look at this text of Scripture, see our times? What does that mean for us today? Well, first, we must establish the importance of that message, that great message, that doctrine of reconciliation. Reconciliation means the end of enmity or the end of hatred, the ending of strife. And so we do need to know its significance uh, for the Jews. Because they too are saved and reconciled to God. And they too are saved and reconciled to other nations through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in him alone. Therefore, the Jews are not superior than anyone else because they have the same need for the Lord Jesus Christ. And even though as a nation, they do enjoy the distinct privilege of being the only nation that God set apart for himself, we do know that the only way that they as individual people uh, can uh, receive the gift of salvation is through the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And now when we look at that truth, that blessing is extended uh, to the nations, uh, to those who hear the gospel and respond to the message to turn from their sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone enjoys the same salvation blessings in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now today, we as believers apply that timeless truth in our lives, and we look at uh, this text of Scripture and begin to learn what defines us as a people. And what defines us as a people is not our ethnicity, it is not our cultural, uh, our cultural convictions, our cultural practices, our cultural history. What defines us is Christ Jesus alone and our standing with the Lord Jesus Christ. So our earthly possessions, our status, our rankings in this world, however the world may rate us, it bears no significance on the eternal weight of salvation. So who you are in Christ 
becomes the pinnacle of living in this earth and living for eternity. Let me just add to that, beloved. Who we are in Christ is also the testing point for relationships. The testing point for relationships is not our relatability. It is our standing with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. The testing point for relationships is not how we can get along using natural means. No, it is how we can fellowship through supernatural means. And that is the power of the Spirit of God uniting once rebels and enemies together through the blood of Jesus Christ who offered himself up for us. That is what defines us and that is the testing point for relationships. Well, think about chapter 1 of Ephesians. It began not with earthly blessings. It didn't begin with earthly comforts. It did not begin with material equality for all. It began with God's divine distribution of His blessings through the Lord Jesus Christ. And all who are in the blessed Savior Jesus Christ receive the same benefits, according to Ephesians chapter 1. The same salvation benefit. So throughout the letter... The present blessing that we have in Christ Jesus stands in contrast to your hostility. Whether it be between you and God or other people, it stands in contrast to that. So you pass estrangement from God and the chief horizontal enmity or strife, which was the one between the Jews and the Gentiles. Those two, those two points the estrangement from God and the enmity between Jews and Gentiles will serve as the epic struggle in all relationships. And if Christ resolved those conflicts, then the mending of other relationships is achievable only in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. There will never be a sufficient social cause or social movement that can mend uh, these broken, sinful, these depraved relationships. Only Christ who brings life can restore a sense of meaning and the glory of God in relationships. And that is what Ephesians is declaring to us. Not only that, nothing in this life can rob us of the eternal gift of reconciliation's enjoyments. Nothing in this life can do that. For that matter, beloved, all conflicts that we see in this world as believers are under the authority of the risen Savior. It is under the authority of the risen Savior. I'm talking about the believer. I'm talking to the Christian. I'm talking to the saint. All conflicts are under the ultimate authority and power of the risen Savior. And our Savior is declaring that he put an end to to all hostility. Now we do know that the church, the believers, we, we have to begin to exercise that privilege in our daily life of sanctification and our relationships together. But on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, he killed the enmity. And those who are in Christ receive the benefits of this reconciliation to where you can reconcile relationships. You can reconcile difficult relationships. You can reconcile when sin has been committed against you. You can reconcile in your marriage because you have been reconciled to God and to each other. There is no enmity at all on this earth that can surpass, supersede, or overthrow the power of the reconciling God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I did say this last week. I think we must repeat it once more that when the church demonstrates this unity, this reconciliation, that we're one in Christ, that the church is to display to the world the power of God in uniting enemies to himself and each other. The church is a display, not in speech as much as it is by our life together, that the power of God unites enemies to himself and with each other. And so we must always ask the question, am I participating in that? Am, am I participating in this life of a unified body, or do I just love dissension? 
And there are many who believe they have the gift of dissension. And that gift comes from the devil. It's not from God. It's demonic. It, it, is, it, is, it is fleshly. It is sinful. But those who are united pursue unity according to the truth and pursue unity even if it may cost them something for the glory of God. You must always ask yourself that question. Am I, am I in this fellowship? Am I part of the body of Christ? Am I part of the, the church, the local church, but also the church universal, those who have been called to salvation? Am I, am I truly pursuing unity God's way? Because it is a display. So unity in Christ, the act of believers moving forward, united in Christ, preaches to the world, proclaims to the world the power of God to unite former enemies together by the same power, listen, beloved, by the same power that God exercised in raising Christ from the dead. You recall in chapter 1, that a part of the prayer in chapter 1 was that the saints will grasp and know who God is and God's will for them. In verse 18, he wants your eyes enlightened so that you may know what is the hope to which he's called you to. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? So presently the hope, the riches now and also in the future. But then in verse 19, the, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might, and now it's illustrated in verse 20 that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Verse 22, and he put all things under the feet of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and gave Christ. And this word give, as I remind you often, beloved, is an act of God's gift, an act of God's grace as a gift to the church, that Christ is God's gift to the church as head. The one who's head over all things, he is also the head of the church. This is nothing but an infinite resource of power for the church. So the question is not, why can't we all just get along as that once famous philosopher said? But it's why are we not getting along in the fellowship? When the same power that raised Christ from the dead, God has made that same power available to us. So now the question has to be asked, is spiritual life resonating in you or are you spiritually dead? For we find that the power of God by his spirit is presently at work, not trying to work, not planning on working, not will eventually work. Listen, beloved, our God's power is never short-circuited. But certainly your sins can affect the efficacious nature of that power. In other words, the actualization of that power in your life. Yes, sin can do so. But what harms it more than anything else is for you to think that you're a Christian and you're not. You're dead in your sin. And it is seen by your active pursuit of divisiveness. But now... The news is actually glorious. That God does in our lives what we cannot do ourselves. Is to give us an affection for true biblical unity by bringing us to this, this climax in verses 19 through 22. That to appreciate the fact that you were once an enemy of God, you were once alienated from the life of God, you were never a part of the covenant of promise. Verse 12, you were w without hope and without God. Verse 12, the very beginning, you were separated from Christ. But in the mercy of God, this God who's rich in mercy has brought spiritual life to you to enjoy the benefits of salvation and enjoy the benefits of being united with a body of people who outside of Christ, would not have a keen interest in each other. Well, we must get to the text, beloved, but what do you think draws us together? It is not a common earthly interest. It is a common Savior. That is the common bond we have in Him. So now, last week we did look at verses 19 and 20 because we 
We want to understand the seals of your belonging and corporate unity, that those seals, it's not you, it's what God has done, it was, it's what God is doing. And so they're seals of your belonging and corporate unity. Why do you belong? The seals are here in verses 19 through 22. And last week, we said that you are fellow citizens and members. Your fellow citizens and members. So then, in verse 19 of Ephesians 2, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Last week, you were also given two implications to consider. The first is this, when members live united, it gives evidence of reconciliation. It gives evidence of reconciliation. When members live united, it gives evidence of reconciliation. And then the second implication is that a corporate view of unity stands in relationship to the triune God. A corporate view of unity stands in relationship. We're all united together in Christ Jesus, but it stands in relationship to the triune God because the triune God are united in this holy effort of bringing hostile, indifferent people uh, people have their own opinions, people have their own convictions together and bringing them under the teaching of the apostles and the prophets as Christ has commanded for them to do and building them up in that truth so that they grow closely together in Christ, but also with each other. Look at verse 21. That's the second seal of your belonging in corporate unity. And it is you are growing into a holy temple. You're growing into a holy temple. Verse 21 says, In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. I do want you to notice how Christ, beloved, the cornerstone is working here. Because how you view the work of Christ will affect your understanding of the building itself. It will affect your understanding of the members in that building. So we need to really take heed to verse 21. Because unity is not the work or achievement of man. Unity is the work that Christ is doing, and he's presently doing, as he's done in the past, he's doing it successfully. And in Christ here, you have the joining of two groups, Jews and Gentiles, into one. And now, this joining here, this structure, is not a dysfunctional unity. It is a coherent unity. In fact, the sense in the Greek word for being joined together, in verse 21, it is, it is an architectural expression or a design concept where a master designer fits the parts together in a functional, listen, beloved, in a functional and an attractive manner. And you've seen the difference between a one-year-old putting a Lego building together, and when they turn about three or four, you, you see improvements. You've probably seen that over your own life. If your brothers have had a project that you've done and the first project you've done, you'd rather put away somewhere that no one sees it uh, because you have made progress over the time. It may have looked dysfunctional in the beginning. You couldn't really put it together. Beloved, this master designer is not making any mistakes. There are no flaws in his design. He is perfectly fitting together parts. And this is the, this is the interesting Parts that normally do not gel together. That's what he's doing. So this stresses the creative power to fit stones together. Remember, these stones are, are not prime stones. They're not the best of stones. You're talking about sinners saved by the grace of God. The stones are believers from all walks of life. You realize that? If you have ever asked someone, what did the Lord do to draw you to saving faith? And if they pull out the whole history, you're amazed sometimes at what God has done. But you ought to be amazed at your own salvation. That God saves you. That God rescued you. Remember, the stones here, this is what makes this so astonishing. So why God receives the glory. The stones are believers from all walks of life. Think about the believers in Ephesus, for example. It's a history rooted in pagan beliefs. Now add to that a historical baggage of bitterness. 
that the general feeling towards the Jews was that of bitterness. But you're going to hear the gospel from the Jews. But you have bitterness that's rooted in the heart of every human being. In Ephesus, you had false worship. In Ephesus, you had witchcraft. And imagine what is added to these stones, just to corruption. But these stones are worn out from the hardships of life and sin. But the designer, God has chosen them and called them before the foundation of the world with all of their sins, with all of their woes, with all of their depravity, a world of dead and depraved sinners. And now he has the task of fitting them together as his masterpiece. And that is what this text is declaring. Because you have not only Gentiles from various backgrounds, and Ephesus was the melting pot of religions, now you have the Jews coming in who may have had more conservative convictions. But the text says that Jews and Gentiles with contrasting backgrounds of history, contrasting backgrounds of tradition, of cultural differences, and let me just say cultural indifferences, are now drawn together in the Lord Jesus Christ and united to make up one cohesive building because they're skillfully and strategically joined by God. That, beloved, the fitting, the shaping, the molding of that structure produces a people in Christ unlike any other. There's an analogy of, of what it means for a structure to be joined together, but it is used in a more practical sense in Ephesians 4. But in this case, the metaphor is, is a reference to the body, but the point is the same. In verse 16 of Ephesians 4, it says, The whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And so you have the indicative, the, the truth, the statement of truth made here in verse 21 of Ephesians 2. But then in that statement of truth, the indicative affects the commands or the imperatives that the mindset, the vision, the objective that the believer should have is in line with what God is doing in building up the body or refining the body, sanctifying the body, removing those, no, not those rough edges, that's just too, that's just too cute. Those, those sinfully rough edges that you have. Yes, 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 you, you got them. They're there, they were here this morning. I didn't see them, but I know they're there. Well, how do you know they're there? Because I have them too. Those sinfully rough edges, that's what God is doing in sanctifying us and fitting us to be his building to look more, and listen, to look more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ in our character. Doesn't mean a loss of your personality. Just means the qualities, the virtues that you exhibit will become more and more like Christ and less and less like your sinful ways and the sinful world that you once identified yourself with. Yes, God is removing those sinfully rough edges as he's building the church, as he's building the body, maturing the body. And we as saints have a part to play in that in so much as we're submitted to that central truth that you and I are growing into a temple. You said, I, I don't think I'm growing. I, I don't see signs of growth. Well, there are two ways to look at this. And the, the first is to examine the word of God carefully and realize that the power to grow is not in yourself. The power to grow comes from God. Therefore, it is indispensable that you have the Spirit's life in you in order to grow. Without that, there's no growth. Now, we can produce artificial growth, and it looks like we're all growing, and, and intellectually we're growing in one sense, but spiritually there's, there's no true putting off of the sin. I mean, what about, just to illustrate that, what about forgiving those who are hard to forgive? What well, it says, kindness to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. It affects your interaction in forgiving, your interaction in communication, because 
Christian maturity is, is seen also in, in your ability to have a deep interest in always building someone up. There's a difference between building someone up and, and just positive trash. You know there's such thing as positive trash? Yeah. I'm just going to be a positive person every day. That's, that's trash. That's not true. Because there's some, there's some instances where you're going to have to tell someone a hard truth that is not positive for them. The scripture says to don't be positive, but speak the truth in love. And there's only one source of truth for the Christian. That's the word of God. So it's not about being positive. It's about being Christ-like. Making sure that as you speak, there's grace, there's kindness, there's affection that you truly care for the person. Because there are times when we are more concerned about having something to say to them than wanting their growth in Christ. That I'm going to correct this person because they're wrong and I'm right. As opposed to saying, I want to go to this brother, sister in love and kindness because they need to know that this is wrong. I want them to be more like the Savior. And all that, not to be the zeal for the husbands and their wives. Wives to the husbands, I, I want my spouse to know the Lord. I want my children to be saved and know the Lord Jesus Christ. When you always correct him because you're angry or frustrated, because the dishes aren't right, the pot's not right, the spoon's not right, it's not clean, the yard's, yard's not manicured, are you angry as an act of idolatry or are you truly concerned about someone's spiritual growth? Beloved, this all comes from God. So when you get to the, the practical implications and, and then the exhortations to do, the source comes from Christ. So Christ is growing all of his people into a holy temple. Is what verse 21 is making clear to us. And as every believer is in Christ, every believer is growing this way. But we, we must ask the question, who is a member of? of the temple or the church. This analogy is using the temple. Beloved, it, it is men and women who are being built up in Christ. They're members. There's, there's the, the work of God in salvation. There's God alone. There's work in God in salvation, but it's, it's his power alone that enables us to obey, enables us to follow. No one can follow Christ for the glory of God apart from the power of God. No one can be saved by God's grace apart from the power of God. And the same thing is true. Men and women who are being built up in Christ are members because God intricately and intimately connects us together. You can also compare that to your life before salvation. Before salvation, you were an enemy of God. But in Christ, you are side by side in fellowship with God, side by side with the saints. So, beloved, the building of the church is something that God is doing and he's building every believer up in this building. He's shaping us. He's removing those sinfully rough edges. He's pouring in the virtues of Christ. Uh, he's, he's compelling us to be more like Christ, but he's also enabling us to be more like Christ. Another question that you may ask is, well, how can I be confident, especially when we see how the church, and even as believers in our personal life, we may fade in and out of these truths? Well, something that you almost must remember, that that what God is doing in the life of the church today and, and the results are not always in harmony because of our sin. It's not because, because God is powerless, but because of our sin. Because of our sin. So we, we cannot forget that. But beloved, this work by God is not a random effort. Another, another source of confidence is to remember that God is building a united body of believers, and he planned to do this before the foundation of the world. Thirdly, verse 21 stresses this, that there is a seamless structure that God is building. Seamless, but not sinless. That does not come until the future glory. But presently, he's building a seamless structure. And the way that structure becomes seamless is through spiritual maturity. The more we conform to Christ is the more we look like a unified building. And it doesn't mean that you lose your personality. Remember, it's the virtues of Christ. It's the characteristics of Christ. It is the goal that Christ has set for us. 
We begin to share in all of those key goals, those key objectives. We begin to emulate Christ together. Albeit we may, we may mature on different levels, we are all growing because the scripture says you are growing into a holy temple. This is what God is doing. It's not a project. It's not on God's wish list. It's not on God's bucket list because he doesn't have one. He has a predetermined will, and in his predetermined will, he has determined that you and now will grow together into a holy temple. You're not all a part of that. With this, with this structure that is seamless but not sinless, it grows with maturity, and when it grows with maturity, ethnic and social differences or ethnic and social indifferences can never destroy that building because God is building it according to his wisdom, his wisdom, and he's building it according to his power. Now, therefore, it is never a question of if God is building or why is God not building. The question is, are you a part of his building. This is a divine project and it is being built as it was when Christ finished the work and it continues to be built. Let me ask you a few questions. Do you love the diverse people God saves? Not the people who look like you, act like you, think like you, but do you love the diverse people from various ethnicities God saves? Let me ask you this, beloved. Do you enjoy the Christian friendships and the fellowships? Do you enjoy them? When we were separated, did you miss that time of belonging together in corporate worship? Listen, even if you have significant cultural differences. Remember, that is all under the rule and reign of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Christian as he or she is made willing by God. Listen, made willing by God to set aside the liberties to serve others. A Christian is made willing by the grace of God in a loving but uh, in a ruling way to set aside any difference that they may have in order that they may share this life together in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have a zeal for the growth of the church? To the salvation of sinners. Do you have that zeal? As you are participating, declaring the good news to the unbelievers, do you long to see them saved? I have a few more questions, I think. Are you interested in the growth of the building? God's building, not yours, but God's building. If God is building 100 floors, are you content with just one floor? Beloved, and growth here in this text is not a secondary goal. Progress, growth is a part of the goal. Notice the text. It says in this, this verse 21, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows, grows into a holy temple. Now here, this, this, the meaning for growth or grow could either be spiritual maturity or numerical growth. That we can say that if it's numerical growth, that God is adding to the church in number. The sinners who turn to him by faith are added to the church and, and they're added to the structure. They're added to the structure immediately. So we can all agree, I do believe that, that growth numerically and spiritually is the expectation. But I do believe that the action in verse 21 is primarily the process of adding. Because there is an emphasis in chapter 2 and reconciliation on the inclusion by the grace of God to those who repent and believe that they're added to the church and the addition to the church is the addition of diverse people from various ethnicities saved along with the Jews. So numerical growth is fitting to this building. The building grows structurally. 
So you do need more material to build a building so large that it towers over all the other buildings around it. And that is what God, I believe, is building here. A united body in Christ that becomes a tower, a tower of truth, one that demands the attention of all who are to see it. But it is not just about numbers. The structure here, beloved, is never to the exclusion of its quality. The structure is large in number, but it is also large qualitatively. And that quality, beloved, is maturing the believers. It's not enough for someone to come from death to life and God saves them and says, well, you've added to the church now, just figure things out. No, we want them to be fitted. And the way they're fitted is God will use fellow believers to help disciple another. Discipleship is critical. Now, remember that discipleship begins with the preaching of the Word of God. We know that. That's, that's the bulk of discipleship, is, is the preaching. So if you're not getting sound biblical preaching, then you're not being discipled because that's the primary means that God uses. Now, secondary to that, which is important, would be the extension of preaching into our interaction with each other as we talk about the sermon, talk about the Word of God, talk about the preaching. But then you add to that the life on life discipleship where you meet with a, a more mature brother, sister in Christ to be discipled by them. The world would use the word being mentored by someone. The irony is, uh, the irony is, not iron, but the irony is that in so many cases, you have a great musician who wants to be greater. That musician will pursue someone who's better than them to be mentored by them. And so the same analogy is, is for the Christian. You find a brother or sister in Christ, brother to brother, sister to sister, right? Brother to brother, sister to sister, and, and find someone who can help you grow in knowing the Word of God and knowing God and obeying His Word. And then you have also group studies, like maybe at home or Bible studies, which is another method of discipleship, where you meet as a group and, and you study a text or scripture or great doctrine to help you understand and apply it to your life even more. And that is how uh, the building grows qualitatively. So just adding people, as we see many of our modern church growth methods applying, is not theologically consistent with growth because the parts are supposed to fit. Nothing worse than buying something from a store and they put a part in it that doesn't fit and it's the last part to make it work. That is not what God is designing here. Every part added to the building fits. And we all play a part in making sure that those God calls to salvation also matured in sanctification and that they too fit. And so this growth in numbers is building, yes, but it is also the quality, the maturing of the saints because the text says that we are being joined together and we grow into not a random temple, but a holy temple. A holy temple. And I don't want to belabor the point on this truth, but this, this transcends all of the seven wonders in the first century. And the, the Temple of Diana was one of the seven wonders in Ephesus. This towers over the Jerusalem temple. This is marvelous. Now we are the temple where God dwells or tabernacles with us. There's something that I want you to think about, my dear saints, is that the church reflects its master builder's plan when everyone grows together. The church reflects its master builder's plan when everyone grows together. We're being joined together, beloved. We're growing together. Where we're all maturing in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is all setting up the stage for chapters four through six in the application of the doctrine, in the application of the doctrine. There's another essential component to verse 21 that I want you to also remember, and it is that Christianity is not a religion of individuality. It is not a religion of individuality. What, what makes this so powerful 
in verse 21, he says the whole structure or the whole building, which is a representation of believers called to salvation, Jews and Gentiles, once hostile, now they've been reconciled to God. The whole building or the whole structure, which represents the church, is being joined together and we're growing together. Individualism is not a part of the church's life. This is a declaration that reconciled sinners are united together in the Lord, where every believer grows dynamically by the power of God within this vital union. No one is more important, no one less significant, because we're all in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how is this unity possible? Once again, beloved, this is supernatural. This is a work of God. This was God's plan, but it's also God's power with the church. Yes, even Grace Community Church, albeit not in a perfect sense, we will never do it in a flawless sense, but we can display united praise, united worship, thanksgiving, and sacrificial service. That's it, beloved. We can do this by the power of God. United praise, worship, thanksgiving, and sacrificial service, and we can build each other up in the Lord Jesus Christ. This truth, it towers over the pretentious acts of unity in our world. Every avenue applied to pursue unity apart from Christ, it is fake and it is factious. It is not unifying. True unity comes only in salvation. You're being built together, beloved. I want you to just now turn your attention to the third one. We, we just noticed you're growing in a holy, into a holy temple. In verse 22, you're being built together. You're being built together. Verse 22. But if you are looking for the implications, let me give you those implications. Verse 21. Let me just back up just for a moment. Verse 21. God dwells with a community of believers. That's the first implication to contemplate in verse 21. God dwells with a community of believers. And then practical holiness is the fruit of being God's temple. So God dwells with a community of believers. And then the second one is practical holiness is the fruit of being God's temple. But in verse 22, uh, there is a crescendo. And the end of this crescendo, in him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. I know you've noticed that in this text. Have you not? In him that is the Lord Jesus Christ, for God the Father, by the Holy Spirit. You have this, this great Trinitarian hymn in this section. And I want you to notice, beloved, the divine activity to close out chapter 2. You're being built together, but this is a divine work because the action here uh, is what we call passive. And oftentimes we use the term divine passive, which means that someone is active. This is God doing the work. The only activity in our part is that we're recipients of this. This is something God is doing for us. So in Christ, God is building us together into a dwelling place for Him to dwell, for God to dwell, but it is also done by the Spirit of God. So God, the divine agent, is at work even now, as He's at work in drawing two extremely hostile groups together. And that mission continues. Let me just pause on that point. If we think that our times are perilously worse, if you think our times of hostility and the conflict we see and the burning of buildings and, and, and cars and, and police precincts, if we think that it's worse now than it was then, we're wrong. The hostility between Jews and Gentiles was more severe. Yet God, by His power, graciously, powerfully, and patiently brought the church to a place of understanding that in Christ, in Christ alone, you can be built together with people that you formerly hated the day or the week before. That when God saves you, He gives you an affection, a loving affection, even for your enemies. And God, beloved, is still at work today to build you and knit you into that structure. And remember that stone. Remember that stone. You are that stone. I am that stone. We have these sinfully rough edges. We're rough. We're sharp with our tongue. 
We're sharp with our thoughts, sharp with our action. We have these piercing edges of sin on us. Yes, we do. I mean, do you always embrace God's refining? Do you always just say, well, glory be, here it comes once more, I'm being afflicted. Well, what happens if God were to afflict your body with cancer? And the affliction is, is so that you may know Christ more. Beloved, we have these edges of sin in our lives. And our times of resisting correction reveals that. And here's, here's a matter that we as a people don't think about enough. I've mentioned it in other ways, but let me just mention it clearly now. We naturally have an inclination to divide. We naturally have an inclination to divide. Think about an argument that you may have over a topic or maybe even a show. What's one of the first things that you may look for after setting out your argument? You're looking for an ally. Looking for an ally. So you may be in the home, you're going, hashing back and forth, and there's six of you there or seven of you, so it's uneven. And you're looking for four allies to win the argument. But what you've done, even though it's, it's not as apparent, you have divided your home into choosing sides. And then we rejoice that we won, even though we have just divided the home. And that's a very small sample size. But the point is, we rejoice in winning, even if it brings about a division. That's our natural inclination. And we will even use, yes, we will even use good, sound Bible doctrine to divide. Not between those who disagree with us theologically, but those in whom we may even have a partnership with, a friendship with. And then we'll find other saints who may agree with us so that we can further divide the church. Because our natural inclination is toward division. Now, obviously, there are very key theological issues that, that, are, that are indispensable. And yes, there will be that division on basis of those convictions. But even in a fellowship where there's a sense of harmony, we, we have the tendency, remember, it's our natural inclination. Unity is supernatural. Division for us is natural. Winning the argument is natural. God being glorified is supernatural. You being first is natural. Christ being supreme is supernatural. Verse 22 says, yes, it's to triune God at work to bring us to a place of being built together. It is heaven's work where God is shaping you and molding you and sanctifying you toward this unity. And the goal, beloved, what is the goal? What is the goal? So that you can be a better version of you? So that you can be a more happier you? Listen. Holiness is supremely more important than happiness. Holiness is supremely more important than happiness. So there'll be times in this process you're not going to always feel good. But you know, because Christ is being formed in you, that it is good. Beloved, the goal is so that you may be a dwelling place for God. For God, by His Spirit. The idea here of this, this truth, beloved, this dwelling place expresses a sense of belonging with a perpetual or endless quality associated with it. So now you belong, but it is endless. But now Christ, God is dwelling with you, but that dwelling is also endless. There's no ending to God dwelling with you because it is in Christ by the Spirit that you are made a dwelling place for God to inhabit. This is glorious, beloved. This is glorious for the saint. This is the Trinitarian power at work in sanctifying us in this truth. And so when you look at this, the more you grow, the more significant the experience of this occupancy. The more you grow in Christ's likeness, not just knowledge, my dear precious saints, though, though that is important. There's the experiential part of this knowledge, to live it out. When you live out this truth, when you live it out in your life, 
you will appreciate the occupancy more and more, and then you will love to serve Christ more and more. And that is one of the signs of true Christian maturity. The more you mature, the greater your zeal for unity because you know you're being built together and that building is for dwelling place for God. A dwelling place for God. And so now the church is being built to become, listen, not one of the seven or eight wonders of the world. God is building the church to become the only wonder of the world. In the future glory, that wonder will be seen for the world to behold. But are you a part of that today? Are you a part of that building that God is building? And one day that building in all of its perfection will be seen before all creation. The display is partial now, but it is imperfect because of our sin. But when God glorifies us and gives us a glorified body, this building that he was building will become apparent to every ruler and every authority. And that final display of the perfect union of the saints in glory. Until then, beloved, let us gaze our attention on this Trinitarian hymn of grace, of God's power and of God's will, that in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Holy Spirit. All of us, all of us, we belong together. We grow together. We serve together. We live together in Christ because we all belong to him. I do want to provide a couple of implications from verse 22. And it is this. Every stone is necessary for God's building. Or every Christian is necessary for God's building. Mind you, I just want to set that before you so when we get to the exhortations, you're not thinking, well, I'm growing, so it's fine. No, you should have a heart to see the growth of other saints. You should have a heart to see them grow. Secondly, unless we forget this, numerical and spiritual growth is God's work. Numerical growth, God adding to the church, and spiritual growth, it is God's work. It is God's work. We can't make anyone grow. God uses us to present the truth so that uh, through the word, he enables them to grow. But it is all of God's work. And remember, God is presently at work by his spirit in Christ, sanctifying his church, growing his church. And that is the seal of your belonging, beloved. If you believe that your fellow citizen, a member, that is your belonging in Christ. If you know that you're growing into a holy temple, that is a part of your belonging. That is a seal of your belonging. You're being built together. That is a third seal, beloved. Those are divine seals of your belonging and corporate unity. I do have a few points for you to meditate on. Once again, I will not read it slowly because it is in the church's app or the website for you to look at later. But if you have that before you, we can look at it together. And the first one is this is, a new humanity in Christ consists of people with similarities and societal differences with a common Savior, a common bond, and a common love for each other because of the love they receive from God. Secondly, peace with each other is rooted in the mutual, active, abiding, all-surpassing peace from God who dwells in us by His Spirit. And then thirdly, the sacrifice of Christ, beloved, was so costly, so infinite in His power, is now a fundamental reason for believers to pursue peace with each other. And fourthly, reconciliation is the end of all hostility and is the beginning of mending relationships and making those eternal relationships last. Some application for you in conjunction with the three points for you to reflect on. First is that as a fellow member and citizen, honor your home with God by applying his commands toward your relationships. Beloved, concern yourself with the spiritual growth of another. Let the unity of the Spirit guide your efforts to live as a peacemaker and learn to speak lovingly and truthfully to others. It is not just about the truth, but it's the truth 
speaking in love. Number two, as a holy temple, use your life for God in all things. Let your life be consumed with the glory of Christ and the spiritual benefit of others. Let the word of Christ by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, shape you into the glorious masterpiece God is designing for a future with Him. And then as united people, let what unites sinners in Christ, the sacrifice of Christ alone, be the only object for your deeds toward others. And there's one more thing that I just want to mention for us to give all glory to God. Because it is true that our master builder has the power to fit us together. That's astonishing. That's astonishing. It is not opposites attracting. Because we will all be repulsed toward each other at some point. No, beloved, is our master builder. God has the power to fit us together. But are you enjoying the process in sanctification? Have you been convicted today of your sin? Your sin of not loving the congregation as you should, serving each other? Have you been so consumed with serving yourself that you did not look to care and serve others? Are you a peacemaker because you know you have peace with God, you've been reconciled to God? I'm not saying are you a compromiser, you must hold to sound biblical conviction. But as you do so, are you pursuing peace with others, with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, fellow members that you're, in share, you're sharing this inheritance with? The reason why I ask those questions is because that's, that's what our master builder is doing. And I want you to be a part of it, not through deception, not through your own power. You can't whip yourself together. You can't get yourself together. This is divine work. This is a work of God. And I pray but even in this moment, if you're living a self-deceived life, if you have not turned from your sin, but you're religious enough, but not regenerated at all, that may God bring that sense of guilt to you now so that you can truly be a part of the eternal church. There is a temporal church. There is one. It is the one where unredeemed people are deceived into thinking that God's wrath does not abide against them. But then there's a true church that recognizes that we're delivered from the wrath to come through one man and one man alone. And it is a sacrifice of the Savior for us. That's the church I pray that you are a part of. And I pray that God has graciously worked in your heart. But if he has not, my prayer is that he will. He will open your eyes to see that you are that sinner who is in need of a righteousness that you simply do not have. And that is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ in exchange for your unrighteousness. May God help us all. May God save anyone here who is not truly abiding in Christ. But may God sanctify his saints in this truth today that our belonging has nothing to do with culture, ethnicity, our social status. It has everything to do with our place in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have all been united in Christ by God's grace through our faith in the finished work of Christ and Him only. Oh, saints and those who are here, please stand with me as we give God thanks uh, for His word of truth toward us. To our Creator who called us into existence, and who created that which was never existed before by the word of his power. I pray according to the same power and will that you have ordained our eternal life through Christ. I pray that that fellowship that we have with Christ will be rich and sweeter. I pray that as we mature and grow in our knowledge of who you are in Christ, that we will grow in our confidence of our place in him and that be our sufficiency whether we are rich or poor, that Christ is our life and he's all that we need. I must confess that yet in our sins and failures that you're merciful. But I do pray that by the power of your truth, the Holy Spirit enabling us to do your will, that we would exercise this privilege and distinct honor of displaying before the earthly powers and rulers that you are a reconciling God as, as we live out this unity that we have in the Spirit, as we gather together, to remember our great Savior, 
day by day that we reflect on the great work that he's doing in uniting enemies, reconciling them to you and to each other. Now, dear saints in Christ, as you live in this world of rebellion, as you engage with the world in confusion and controversies, may the good news of reconciliation be your message of consolation. May the good news be your comfort in conflict. May the gospel of peace be your daily rest and the coming of your Savior be your daily expectation. In Christ's name and all God's people said, amen.